Well, it's time for another COVID-19 edition of a Bitty Mold Supply mold making and casting tutorial. In this video, we'll be explaining the process of making a simple cut block mold using one of our new silicones. This is our P508, which lends itself very well to both simple resin casting and cold cast resin casting for metallic effects. So we're going to show how to make a basic mold and then also how to do a basic resin cast and a basic cold cast using the dusting method. Now the part we'll be molding is a resin cast part. This is a little resin decorative handle that was sculpted by Cup Creations a while back for us. And Patrick stuck these up all over our shop as little handles to open some of our cabinets. And he sculpted this to look like a wrought iron piece. And we originally made the mold in uh, Platzil 7110. And uh, that mold is getting close to the end of its life, so we thought we'd remold it using some of the new uh, P508. Now to begin, I'm going to anchor this to a flat piece of foam core board. Uh, foam core board is a great way to make mold boxes. It's cheap, it's easy to cut without a table saw, and you can just score it like we did here. I just cut a strip of it and then went back and scored that and broke it along those edges and then used that to form a rectangular box around my part. So it's a very simple way to make a mold box. And an important note here, when you're building a mold box like this, uh, whatever container will fit the best around there with the least amount of clearance is ideal. You don't want to have a lot of wasted space because wasted space is wasted silicone. So you want to make sure your box is relatively tight, but obviously not touching that part. So in this case, I wanted a clearance of a, at least about a half inch around my part for a small mold like this. Now the other must have item for small block molds like this is a good quality hot glue gun. This is one that I found on Uline that uh, it's kind of the hot rod hot glue gun that you'll see us using in a lot of our tutorials. And one of the reasons I'm a big fan of hot glue for this kind of application is hot glue is basically a vinyl and it's a, a, a very firm vinyl that doesn't inhibit platinum silicone. And so we're both anchoring our box to the board and sealing it at the same time. Now we could add some uh, oil-based clay to further seal that box up, but this is a great way to get a good seal on a mold box and anchor everything together all at the same time. And it gets a really good bond. Now to release our pattern, we're going to use some of the Eject It 33 mold release. And even though with silicone we don't have to use a mold release, that will really help everything come out a lot cleaner, especially to make sure it doesn't stick to that mold box. Now we're ready to calculate the volume on our mold box. Now one quick way you can do this is by dumping dry rice into the mold box and then pouring that back out, checking that volume. But uh, in order to do this by weight and make sure we accurately measure out the right weight of silicone, what we're going, we're going to do is uh, take the length and width and height and multiply that together, which gives us 28 cubic inches of volume. Now this particular silicone we're using is a fairly low density silicone. It's about a, I think about a 25 or 26 cubic inches per pound. So that means this is going to take just over a pound of liquid silicone. So for this, I decided to measure it out uh, about 250 grams of part A and 250 grams of B by weight. And you'll notice one of the things I do in a lot of our videos where we're mixing and measuring silicone and resin is I'm doing it all in one measuring cup. And the reason for that is that minimizes waste and it makes cleanup a lot easier because we don't have to clean the residue out of a cup in order to reuse it again. Everything gets mixed in together. Now this does require an accurate scale and a little bit of patience and make sure you're pouring as accurately as possible, but you'll find that uh, pouring that all in one cup just uh, makes it a lot less expensive, a lot less cleanup, and uh, a lot more accurate in the end. Another important tip when you're pouring out a silicone like this where the A and B are almost identical, it's a good idea to make sure if you pour one component to put the cap back on and set it in a totally different area. And that way you don't accidentally grab that and pour that twice. No matter how many years you've been doing this, it's real easy to, to get uh, uh, silicones like this mixed up and accidentally pour two part A's or two part B's and that can lead to some profound sadness. 
And now we're ready to mix this up. Now you'll notice this is a very low viscosity silicone, so it doesn't require any vacuum degassing. And we just want to make sure we stir that thoroughly, scraping the sides and the bottom of the container really well. And you don't have to create a vortex in there. You don't want to whip air into the material. You just want to make sure everything is incorporated into that mixture, which again is another good argument for mixing everything together in one cup and not transferring the contents from other cups because you can easily lose some of that residue, which uh, when you're working in small batches could throw off your ratio. And now ready to pour our silicone. We're just going to find the lowest point in the box and just pour in a thin stream until we fill up the box. So again, very low viscosity, so very fast. And a little extra trick I'm going to do is stick my finger in there. I'm wearing nitrile gloves, so I don't have to worry about this uh, contaminating that with my skin or anything. But I'm just going to take my finger and rub that up under the underside of the uh, handle to make sure no air bubbles are trapped under there. Now the P508 silicone we're using has a working time of around 15 minutes and a demold of four hours at room temperature. Here in Texas, it's gonna be a little bit faster, but one thing I always like to do is demold what's in the mixing cup first and use that to check my mixing and also check to make sure this has handling strength to a point where it's uh, ready to demold out of the actual mold. And uh, if you find that uh, demolding that uh, what's left over in the mixing cup is difficult or if it uh, has low tear strength, then that's a good sign that you need to wait a little bit longer before you demold your actual mold. So here's our part. Everything came out well. We have a nice cured block mold. And one of the things we'll need to do here is do some surgery to get our part out. So we're going to cover that really quick. Always good to have a plan of action for how you're going to demold your part. So here what we'll need to do is flip this over and when we turn this mold upside down, we're going to have to make a slit underneath the part and this is where the clarity of that P508 helps us. We're going to make a cut through uh, on the bottom of that handle and that will allow that handle to come out. So that gray area there represents where we're going to cut with our X-Acto or our scalpel. So real important to have a plan of action there. And also, because that uh, this is a fairly soft rubber, we don't want that to misalign. So we're going to create that cut, as you might have seen in uh, some of our other videos, with kind of a zipper kind of configuration to it. Now here we're just dislodging our original resin piece from that board. And you can see we got a nice clean mold. We just got to clear off a little bit of that uh, foam core board that was stuck with the hot glue. And now I'm going to show where we'll cut this open. Again, we're going to make kind of a, a little zigzag cut so that we have some keys to allow that uh, rubber to realign after we cut it open. And you'll see I start out straight on one end and I make that little squiggly line like kind of a zipper. And then on the end, I go back straight again. And that way we have some nice keys for a good positive registration so that mold goes back together once it's cut open. And it's really important with... Uh, any kind of silicone mold, but especially one like this that's fairly soft. This uh, P508 cures to right around a short A10. So if we're not careful, we could have this distort just because of how soft it is. And uh, here I'm just using an X-Acto to cut that zigzag shape in. And I'm rounding those corners off. So it's not really a true zigzag. It's more, think more like a zipper with kind of an S curve going down and then straightening out at the end. And the reason I'm going with that and not a deliberate zigzag is the sharp edges of a zigzag cut could lead to tears later on. So it's, it's a good idea to have curves rather than straight dead ends. And now once I've made that initial cut, I'm going back in and cutting all the way down to the resin part. And at this point, sometimes it might help to have an extra set of hands. You'll notice uh, Douglas steps in to uh, help hold open the mold as I make those final cuts. And that just ensures that I get everything as accurate as possible and we don't make extra cuts that don't need to be there. Because uh, if we make too many cuts of the mold, we're going to have some really funky looking seams later on. And a quick word about why I chose the P508 on this rather than, say, uh, maybe one of our firmer silicones like 7325. It's mainly because this is such a soft rubber, it's going to really help grab metal powders when I do cold casting in this mold later on. So you'll find that softer molds like this typically grab that metal powder much better than uh, firmer silicone molds. So you'll see that here in just a minute. But uh, first, we're just going to do a very basic resin cast, just using some 
some EasyFlow 60. And EasyFlow 60 is a very popular resin for this kind of part because it can be used without pressure casting for a lot of simple parts like this. And it's very impact resistant. This is not a brittle resin. So we don't have to worry about if you were to accidentally drop most parts, they're not going to shatter. So this is a great way to make tough parts and uh, economically cast parts. So, and because of the low viscosity, this stuff pours like water. So it's very easy to get bubble free parts again, without pressure casting. And this is mixed one to one by volume. By weight, this is 90 parts of B to 100 parts of A. And the only reason I mention that weight ratio is if you're working in very small batches, sometimes it's a good idea to switch over to the weight ratio because it's very difficult to accurately eyeball very small batches. So uh, when in doubt, go to that weight ratio for very small batches of resin. Now, when I'm measuring by volume, I usually don't mix uh, less than about four ounces, just because below that, it, unless you have really accurate graduated containers, it's very hard to get that uh, right on the money. So I like to keep a few other molds sitting around to pour that excess resin. So here I've got a little sample ear mold that I'm pouring up. That's a Platzil 7111 mold. And now I'm going to let those sit and cure completely, which takes about 15 to 20 minutes. You'll see initially after it starts to gel, it turns white. You'll see that handle start to turn white a little bit after that ear because it's a thinner cross section. Because we can see into that mold a little bit, you can actually see that uh, becoming more opaque. And remember that resin cures the reverse of an air drying material. So the thinnest area will cure last. So in, that, in this area, it's those little mounting brackets. So make sure you give it plenty of time to cure. Usually, again, whatever's left over in the mixing cup, demold that first. And that's a good indication of what has cured inside your mold. Because if for some reason you can't see into that, uh, if you've got figurines with tiny hands or uh, little thin cast areas, it's always a good idea to use the what's left in the mixing cup as an indicator of what's going on in the mold. So now when we can safely demold that ear with that thin edge, that's a good indicator that our handle is ready to demold. And again, this is about 15 to 20 minutes later. And this is also on a hot Texas day. So that added heat is also going to speed up that demold time. So if it was the winter time and it was say right at about 65, 70 degrees, we might want to give that an extra five or 10 minutes. Uh, it's never going to hurt to give it more time in the mold, but, uh, you just want to make sure you don't pull it out too soon and warp the part. And one of the nice things about the EasyFlow 60, it's a very sandable, machinable resin. So we can easily go back in there with a sharp knife and remove that seam. And because we have that nice keyed seam, everything went back together nicely and we have almost no flashing. So I'm just going to do some quick cleanup there. And now we have our finished cast resin part. And we could also go back and mold several of these in a gang mold if we were so inclined, if we wanted to mass produce these little guys. Now we're gonna finish up with a quick tutorial on cold casting using the dusting method. We've shown this in some other videos, but I uh, just want to reiterate some important points here real important to use a soft silicone mold with this method. Uh, ideally, seamless molds work the best because cleaning up seams and cold cast pieces can really be tricky. So we're using a, a soft silicone mold, of course. This is the P508 uh, Platinum Silicone. And I'm just pouring that, uh, in this case, I'm using tin powder, pouring that into the mold and pouring it back out. We want to be careful to shake out all of the excess. So what we wind up with is just a thin veneer of metal powder stuck to that silicone mold. And now we're ready to mix up our resin. I've already poured out the part A. And again, we're mixing up a four ounce batch. So two ounces of part A and two ounces of part B. And because this is going to simulate kind of a silver look, I'm using black in the uh, Easy Flow 60. Since that normally cures white, adding about a little less than 1% of black, we added probably about a gram of black pigment. So mixing that in, when this cures, that will give us a gray color, which is a great background for our metal powder. And the reason we do that, if we just did 
solid, plain white resin. If for some reason the part uh, scratched later on, you would have bright white plastic showing through, which immediately gives away that it's a plastic part and not metal. So uh, adding that background color minimizes how much uh, uh, metal powder we, we need to use and also protects us later on against any kind of scratches that would reveal that we're dealing with white plastic. Now again we're going to let this part sit for about 20 minutes before we demold it and initially when you take this out of the mold it's going to have kind of a dull gray color because we need to actually polish this with some 4 aught steel wool in order to bring out that shine. So we're going to clean this up again, remove that seam, and uh, again, you can either just break that off or use an X-Acto knife to clean that up, and then we're ready to polish it. Now, quick word about polishing. I like to wait, uh, let the resin part sit for a couple of hours at least before I polish it. And the reason is the harder the resin is, the better it polishes. Uh, when it's fairly green right out of the mold, if you're not careful, you could polish through that veneer of metal powder and ruin that part. So it's a good idea to let that sit and then go back and gently polish that with your 4 aught steel wool and bring out that shine. And there you have a cast part that looks like real metal and you could also finish that out with some Sculpt Nouveau waxes if you are so inclined. So there you have the process of making a basic silicone cut block mold using P508 silicone and making an easy flow resin cast. And of course you can find all of that on our website at brickintheyard.com. We're still open in spite of the pandemic so feel free to order online or you can also visit our store in Richardson, Texas. Thanks again for watching and if you haven't already be sure to like and subscribe.